Well, good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. It is a blessing to have any visitors. We are always grateful whenever we have visitors come to worship with us, and we, we pray that you will uh, feel the love of Christ and, and join us together in worshiping the sweet Christ. Well, it's a special morning here at Southside Bible Church because corporately we will remember the Lord's table together. Uh, Jesus has left his bride with this beautiful ordinance. Uh, this do in remembrance of me. And so may we prepare our hearts for such a blessed time together uh, this Lord's day. Paul, when he was instructing the Corinthians on the purpose of communion, he wrote this in 1 Corinthians 11. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, the table is a focus on both advents of Jesus Christ his physical, literal comings into this world that he himself created. The one advent has already taken place in the history of this world when he came and he ended up on Golgotha's hill, Calvary's tree. And he died a cruel death by the way of crucifixion. And this morning, we're going to remember the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins to answer God's Uh, justice and wrath for our transgressions. The Son of God hung in our place and He bore the wrath of God for us. We're going to remember the price then that He paid for our redemption and our ransom price. It doesn't stop there though. It accomplished something amazing and incredible. Yes, it brought the forgiveness of sins and we're going to remember that with great joy together. But it was for the purpose Uh, Later in Peter, he's going to say, to bring us back to God. It it brought us into the great purpose and program of God, and we've been studying that in the book of 1 Peter. It it, it has a consummation. The salvation has a goal in mind, a place where all of salvation history is moving, a place called the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells, a sphere where Jesus Christ is worshipped and adored for all of eternity. This is a little foreshadow of it, where everything created will give praise to its creator. And so as we remember his death, we look back with an eye and we remember his great sacrifice, and we look forward with another eye to this coming future blessing, an inheritance which Peter said is imperishable, undefiled, and it will not fade away. It's an eternal Hope, it's a living hope, it's the salvation of our souls, as he said in verse 9. We look to the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He will come, this time not as a meek and lowly lamb that was led to a slaughter that we remember this morning, but this time as a ruling, triumphing, reigning, unrivaled king of all. He will come with his reward for his bride, for those who have loved his appearing and have been urging and hastening this day. So this morning, we are going to remember both Advents together. Let's go to our God and ask that he would meet us as we remember together. Father, we come before you and we do rejoice in your plan and your program. I rejoice in the first Advent, O God. We marvel that the Son of God would come into earth, that he would take on the form of of a baby and come into a manger. God, we thank you for the humility of the King of Kings laying in a donkey's dish. Oh God, we worship and praise you for this plan and this program, this one who would come and live a perfect life, a, a life of true, full, God kind of righteousness. And we thank you now that that righteousness by grace can be given to our account We thank you that he went up on a cross and he became guilty of the sins that we have committed and will commit. God, we thank you that your justice was satisfied in the one who bowed his head and breathed his last on a cross. I pray this morning, Lord, that our hearts would be full as we look again to that sweet sacrifice. Lord, I pray that it would lift our eyes, though, to the coming advent of Jesus Christ a second time. I pray that all of our hearts would be lifted up in hope of a soon return of Christ. We long you for you, Jesus. Come back for your bride. May it be this day. Come make all things right. Come consummate what you began at your first advent. Lord, that is our hope. That is where we look. That's where we dream. That is what we shoot for. And so as we remember this morning, let all of our hearts be lifted. Maranatha, 
Come, Lord Jesus, come back. God, we thank you for this blessed hope. I pray now, minister to every heart in light of this hope that we have. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, this morning, for our preparation to come to the Lord's table, we're going to look at the hope that we have then at the return of Christ for His bride. The required mindset for the child of God, the the thinking that we are to fight with our minds, the the thoughts as, as the children of God that we are to be taken up with. By God's goodness, we find ourselves this morning in Peter again in a text that will prepare our hearts for just that. And so if you'll continue with me, we're going to be in 1 Peter. Uh, Greg already read verses 13 to the end of the chapter. We're just going to take up verse 13. We finished last week uh, in verse 12 of chapter 1. And we, we, we start a new section of thought this morning And it will transition from the 12 verses that we've been looking at of our great salvation. And we're going to take the gem called salvation now, and we've been turning it around for those 12 verses and just looking at it from different angles and seeing its brightness as the light of God's Word shines on it. We've just kind of been taken up with pure glory of the gospel of salvation that the grace of God has come to us. And I pray that every heart in here is loving, marveling, and worshiping at how great of salvation we have. My, this is the time. With this time today, then, we'll start looking at this new section, verses 13, and I'm going to stop in verse 21. And as we look at it, there are three imperatives in this section. The other are verbs and participles and explanations of those three Commands. So the, the rest, they just kind of Paul's argument about them, flushing them out, giving you further explanation. But here are the three commands that we're going to be looking at. In verse 13, he calls us to hope. Then in verse 15, he calls us to be holy in all of our conduct. And then in verse 17, he says, conduct yourselves in fear while you walk this earth. And so it should be a real interesting season around here as we unfold those. As we look at hoping that is tied into your mind, it's tied into your thinking, not your emotions, not your volition. This hope is with your mind. And so he begins there, Christianity is first about your mind. We live in a day and age where it is first about your emotions, your affections, that you got to set your will to go do and change things. It begins with the mind. It it just jumps in the face of the surroundings and the world and the church and the radio that we listen to and hear everything focused on emotions first. That's just to say your emotions. I want to feel Christianity. That's all I care about. I just want to get out and maybe go do it. I want to do things and change. My mind doesn't have anything to do with Christianity. And Peter's going to show us this morning it begins first with the mind and what we think And that will begin to change your affections for what you love. And that will change your will in what you choose. So it begins in the thoughts. Christianity begins in the mind. And so we think and we learn. And it brings about affections that are holy for God. And it will bring about changed lives. Then secondly, Peter's going to call us to holiness to holiness. Our standard of living is Him. And Peter says, because He's holy. And then he says, the reason that we're holy is Him, because He's holy. So our standard and our reason for our conduct is because He is holy. And we will look and unfold the beauties and the glories of what Peter is going to say. We're going to live holy lives because this God is holy. And then the third imperative is he's going to say, then conduct yourselves in fear which is the one emotion that we have done everything possible to try to get rid of in the church today. We've built a whole system and a way of thought so that I will never feel that emotion. And now Peter's sitting here telling me I'm supposed to have that emotion. Peter comes and he messes up everything, saying in light of the greatness of God's salvation and his graciousness to us, his kindness, his large heartedness, live in fear. How do we... Live then in in great hope and live in great fear. If you don't have an answer for that, you need one. And we're going to fight for it for the next three weeks to try to understand how how do those two marry, how do those two live together. And I just say, just in shepherding dads and moms, 
You need to be training your kids to have all three of these things. In a world, in some places in the church that say they can't be joined together, if you lose one of them, you will lose something vital to how God will protect you by faith for the reward on the last day of what is coming. And so these are going to be really, really important. These are what I I call essentials. They're not non-essentials. These are the things that we must agree on in the Christian life. So I will proclaim them as if they are essentials because Peter's laying them out. This is essential to the Christian life, that your mind hopes that your affections are toward a holy God and that your will is to conduct yourself in fear while you live upon this earth. So how do you live in great hope? How do you live in great fear? If you don't have an answer, that's where we're going to go. So today, we're going to look at the first one. And if you'll look with me just at verse 13, that's where we're going to spend our time and then come to the table. Verse 13 of chapter 1. Therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. Hope. Hope. So verse 13 begins with, therefore. And I was tempted to just preach on that word this morning, but I did it in Ephesians 4.1 and kind of in Romans 12.1. I'm not going to do that to you again this morning, so breathe easy. But it, it's easy to preach a whole sermon on therefore, because I think this therefore is one of the most important words in the Bible. Not the most, but one of them. It has to be understood. You end up without it with moralism. You take out the therefore and you start looking at these things. All you have is moral, nice, good people, which is happening to the church in our day and age. You have people with a cause to alleviate the pain of this world toward the less fortunate, and that's all the church is. It's just about uh, go change the environment and society. Let's get out and go do it. There's nothing more than that. And then on the complete other end, if you don't have a therefore, You end up with just a teaching that you take up. You end up with just academic rigors, with doctrinal squabbling, statements that Christianity is is only what you believe, divided from a transformed life that makes you love like no other. So without the therefore, you can end up with a little moralist, or you can end up with someone who all this is is doctrine and knowledge, and it's not changing my life one bit, and that's Christianity, and both of those are wrong failures. You stand before God one day, and you're going to say, uh-oh, I missed it because of the therefore. It's that important. I've come to believe after de- decades of studying and living and observing sheep that not understanding this therefore will do great harm to your Christian life. It is a must to get this therefore. I think it's so important that I've said this many times, but I want Laura to put it on my tombstone, which is getting really full, (laughs) hon. Jordan, keep making money so you can help mama with this tombstone. And some of the ones on my tombstone are but now, and that's in Romans 3.21, the whole gospel, you're dead, there's nothing you can do, but now, here's what God did. One of the most important things, Philippians 1, I said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, everyone should have that on their tombstone. That's my life verse. If if I get life, I'm going to live it for him. And if I die, it's gain because I get more of Christ. The other one in Galatians was not even Titus was compelled to be circumcised. And I know that will cause many onlookers to say, what does that mean? (laughs) That's gospel. That's gospel. We would never go back to works or anything that you could do to get accepted by God. So Titus wouldn't even get circumcised to give the Judaism their little boast over his flesh. I I will not bend to the gospel. It's a powerful verse. And then, therefore, could explain my life more than any other phrase. And I hope that this morning, every one of you would say, that's my life verse. That, that, therefore, that, that's, that explains it. This is the Christian life. It's a, a reality or a deduction from the first 12 verses of Peter. So in light of, guys, what we've given 12 weeks to look at, in light of this salvation, because God chose us before the foundation of the world. He foreknew you. I want you to get that in your heart. He set his love on you before he created this world. So it had nothing to do with you. Nothing in you can ever cause it to go away. It's an eternal love that God has for his children. And it makes you an alien, Peter says. You're you're aliens. 
You don't belong anymore to this world. It's by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. He came and He took dead corpses and He, he made you alive spiritually to obey Jesus and to be sprinkled with His blood. He caused you to be born again now to this living hope that we're looking at this morning. This hope that is now possible because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And the certainty of Christ is the certainty of my hope. It's a living hope. I too will be raised from the dead because Christ was. It guarantees my inheritance. My inheritance that is undefiled and it won't fade away. This inheritance of dwelling with God forever, it can't go away. And listen to this, it's protected by the power of God. From the day you believe to the moment you go home, you are protected by God's power through faith. Through a faith that God has given to you. He says, I will take that faith and I will stick it in a furnace. And I will boil off your unbelief. I'll boil off your impurities, and I will keep purifying this faith that will cause you to make it to the very end. No trials, you may not make it to the very end. So God will handpick every trial in your life to keep purging and purifying this faith for the goodness that you will make it and receive this inheritance that he has laid up for you. The result is that you believe and you love Jesus Christ, though you've never seen him. I've never seen him, but I love him. And I believe in what he has said. And Peter says, you're going to get the salvation of your souls then because of that. And as to this salvation, God planned it before the foundation of the world. The prophets prophesied by the Spirit of Christ, and they would search and try to understand this great salvation. What is all this? And now the the fulfillment has come, and the apostles and preachers come, and all they can do is preach the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. Everyone come to him, believe in him, look to him. This gospel has been fulfilled. He came. And then we got these angels with an epithumia just looking down, longing, going, what is the gospel of grace? This is so magnificent. It's our, we, we just want to look at it and learn more about it. We're, we're preoccupied with it. It's a passion that can't be satisfied understanding the grace of God. So what a salvation. Marvel it. Let it demand my life, my soul, my all. Therefore, in light of all of that, therefore, this is yours. It has to be taken up. Therefore, go live in light of these realities. There's no legalism possible for the child of God. He's done everything. It's all of grace. Therefore, go live with your minds girded up in holy lives and in fear of this God. In light of this salvation, therefore, there's a response. Go live into what God has done. There's a truth and a doctrine and a reality that you are to build your life upon. You don't understand these things and go live the same way you did before. It's impossible. You can't have your eyes open to see this and say, I'm going to get up like every other American, think the same way, live the same way. It's impossible. Therefore, it has to be your life. Put it on your tombstone. Put it on your refrigerator. Therefore, every day, these gospel realities are so magnificent. Therefore, I get up, take my life, and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. You don't just go try and live a life, a nice life and do these principles. You've got, you've got, you can't be anchored to anything, but let's just be nice and make a better world. That's just wrong. In light of this gospel, live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Therefore, offer up your bodies a living sacrifice in Romans and Ephesians. Therefore, live a life worthy. Therefore, hope completely, be holy and fear. There has to be a response to this gospel or you don't understand this gospel. These two things can't be separated. The therefore, it demands that these two things be married, the gospel of salvation and a holy life. Therefore, has to join these things together. Live a life in light of these two realities. The two are married, doctrine and living. And as pastor has said many times, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Die on that hill. There's a therefore. Don't let anyone separate these two things. Amen? Get a little stirred up. That's beautiful. Therefore, what, Peter? Therefore, therefore, there's something that you're to do. And here's the first commands. There's been no commands thus far in this book. And now, therefore, let me give you some commands. 
what God has done, what he has done to us, the fact that it's all of grace, now respond. Uh, This is a call to born again ones to a living hope. Christianity is first and foremost a call to hope. It's a call to hope. We, We heard that in Sunday school. It's what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. He's done it. It's all of grace. Hope in this. Before you do anything else for God or this kingdom, God wants us hoping before doing. Look at this gospel and set your hope in it. Don't go out, I'm going to do all these things so that I can hope. I first and foremost hope in this gospel, and that brings about doing. We take these truths to our hearts. We understand them. We believe in them, and then we hope in them. Before we do anything holy or conduct yourselves in fear, the first call of Peter is you hope in this gospel. You start with hoping in what God has done, hoping in his marvelous grace. It is so important. I can't, I can't exhort you enough in this. Let it, let it exhort you. Let this gospel bring about, I've got a hope in these truths. It's not enough to doctrinally understand them I see them, and I've put my complete hope in this truth. So you start hoping in God. And so what I want to do first is I want to give you a broad outline of verse 13, and then we're going to jump into it. So come back, 1 Peter 1, 13. Uh, it, it looks like there's a couple commands going on here. Gird your mind, keep sober, and fix your hope. <clears throat> but in the little Greek, there's only one command in this verse. There's only one imperative And the imperative is, fix your hope. And the question that comes to my heart then is, how do I do that? And I need help with this, Peter, because this hope gets lost in a bunch of other hopes that come at me all day long. The world and my flesh keep presenting other hopes and telling me, hey, this is what will really make you happy. And so I've got a million hopes coming at me, and I've got to fix my hope on just one. A little help here, Peter. And so he gives you two participles. And these two participles are modifying how to fix your hope. And so the participles this morning are going to teach us how do I do it? How, how, help us fix our hope, Peter. And so they're not imperatives, but they carry the force of an imperative because they're modifying an imperative. So when we look at uh, girding your minds and, and living sober, there's an imperatival force to them. So there is somewhat of a command because it's following the, the exhortation to fix your hope. And so we need to be exhorted to prepare our minds for actions and to keep sober in spirit. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. And then we're going to go to the table and we are going to fix our hope as we remember the grounds of why we can even hope. And then finally, we're going to look at the grace that's going to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here's your outline. Peter gives us the response then to our great salvation. Therefore, And the first thing we're going to look at is our preoccupation. And then the second point is we're going to look at the prerequisites, the prerequisites for our preoccupation. So look with me in verse 13. Therefore, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely. Fix our hope. It's an imperative. It's kind of like a military command. It's it's the kind of verb that it is kind of focuses on the inception of your hope. You're born again to a living hope. And it's, it's a faith then that was given to you as a gift. It starts right away with hope. And if I could get this verb the best way I know how, it would be like a snapshot of your life. So this little snapshot of our lives as Christians is that we are people who hope in the promise of God. This is just, if I could get a little snapshot of your life, It's just this person that all they do is hope in the revelation of Jesus Christ when he comes back. This is what we've been born again to. We were dead and without hope. We looked at all of that. All of our hopes were vanity. All of our hopes were futile. God raised us from the dead and he saved us. He washed us. He cleansed us. He wrapped us in the righteous garment of Christ. He gave us a new heart. He gave us a future, an amazing future. And to kick it all off, he's going to start with the marriage supper of the Lamb, eternal worship of the Godhead. And he says, that's your hope. And he says, it's certain. We have a certain hope because Jesus is raised and he's already entered into that hope. We're tied to his coattails. Your hope in this child of God is absolutely certain. Set your hope on this day. Let this be the finish line. 
What is the finish line of everything you're running at? I hope it's not graduating college. I hope it's not three kids, you know, whatever, retirement. What is your finish line? Peter says this, fix your eyes in in Hebrews, fix your eyes on the finish line. What's the finish line? It's Jesus Christ. It's the revelation, everything in here. What is your finish line this morning as you sit here? Peter says it better be your hope. When you read uh, of the the salvation in verses 1 through 12, don't you want to be with him? I've never seen him, but I love him. Though you don't see him now, you just want him. Don't you want to get to a marriage of the Lamb and be done with the engagement? Aren't you tired of engagement? Come, consummate marriage, Jesus, come back. I absolutely loved my time of being engaged to Laura Murphy, well, Laura Grieby. And I had butterflies with so much anticipation of that coming day. And I'll never forget, she did this dirty thing. We got engaged and she went off to London for studying overseas for three months. Don't ever do that, ladies. That's just not right. So it just, it made it worse. But, but I knew it was going to end in marriage. So it was probably the easiest time I ever had while she was gone because I didn't know that the, the, this February 10th was coming. And I had such an anticipation. Nothing in my life seemed bigger than that. If I flunked a test, which I was really good at, uh, I didn't even get discouraged. It was just kind of like, oh, February 10th is coming. Nothing really matters but that. But, but could you imagine... If I would have said, you know, that, that girl in my college Bible study is kind of cute, and she can quote John 3.16, maybe we should grab dinner or something. That girl in my accounting class, she's really good with numbers, maybe a coffee with her. My mom says, oh, the phone. This is back when you had phones that rang on a wall, and she's like, oh, it's Laura. I'm watching the Cosby show, is what was popular in the 80s, and say, oh, I'm busy. I'm busy watching Cosby's. A letter in the mail comes and it says, oh, I'm weightlifting. I don't have time to read it. Maybe another day when I'm better focused, then I'll read it. You would say, that guy's messed up. He says his whole life is fixed on the day when he's going to stand on an altar with his bride and he's running around with all these lesser hopes and contradictory things, things that will never satisfy like his wedding day. Does he really believe he's going to get married soon? And I would say, no way. That guy's a fool. Get it. Run from him, Laura. That's bad. So here it is. I see this every day. I see this every day. We have so great of salvation, and God took the Holy Spirit and put an engagement ring upon us. And this coming day of a consummation of a marriage, it is coming. My wedding day with Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, is coming while I'm busying myself with the things that are destined to perish. While I'm finding my hope in lesser things, I I see some people who have more hope in a family than in the coming to you grace of God at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I have more hope in this job that will finally set me free of my financial burdens. I, I know people who hope more in the produce of their garden than in the final product of Christ. My body is where all my hope is placed and put and exercised, and fed, and pampered. My entertainments, my financial freedom, my assets, my dog or cat, if you could imagine. I like dogs, but the cat thing I just can't figure out. I know I'm going to get some letters for that. I'm sorry. Just can't see it. This is the wrong response to a salvation this great. Do you hear me? That is a wrong response. That is as foolish as what I just described if I'd have done that with Laura. This is such a great salvation. To sit and now chase all these other hopes, be preoccupied with them, spend your life on those things, it is the wrong response to the great salvation. That's not there for. That is going to miss the whole thing. This is to be your priority. It is to be your number one focus, your number two focus, and your number three focus. It is your hope. This has to take up your mind, your heart, your all, everything. Hope. It's as certain as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And God wants you to hope so much that he, he made a promise that he's going to do this. And he even he took an oath. And when you're God, who do you swear by greater? I swear by God that I'm going to keep my word. God, God promised. He can't lie. He made an oath. He did everything possible so that this would be certain and that you could absolutely bank everything on this hope, this amazing hope that every child of God has. This is to be our focus. 
We gather this morning and we revive and we refresh our hope through teaching and singing and fellowship. Peter, they're going through great suffering. This church is getting pummeled and they're about to get killed by Nero and he wants to remind them, this is not your home. You are aliens. It doesn't have to all work out here. You don't have to grab the gusto. You don't have to get it all here. It can be full of furnaces and fires and squeezings for a little while, which is temporal. But my hope is freedom with no more pain and suffering, fears, no fears for all of eternity, dwelling with God in perfect righteousness forever. That's our hope. We suffer poorly when we don't hope. We suffer well when it purifies our true hope. I've watched it. When it purifies your hope of what is real and what I'm talking about this morning, you suffer well. And when your hope is this earth, you suffer very, very poorly. This is gonna show this furnace of where your hope is. And that's the grace of God is to, if it's temporal, if you've become earthy, he'll bring something that will force you to look past all of this stuff and look to this blessed hope again. We suffer well when it purifies our true hope. I think that is why Peter, look with me in verse 13. Therefore, he says, fix your hope, what? Completely. Completely. This word means fully. It means to fix with finality. Fix your hope with finality. Completely. This is my hope. This is my life. I am betting the bank on this. Guys, this is with finality. There is nothing else that I have a secret hope in. This is who I am. I've been born again to this living hope. This is my identity. This is what I have found. My hope is this, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It it means that there's no safety nets. There's no secondary plans. I pray to Allah just in case that might be right. I'm trying to get as much as possible here just in case there is no future and I'm just dust and everything ends. I've got all these other little possibilities. And Peter says, this is with finality, guys. You hope in nothing else completely, completely. I'm fixing my hope not on a husband or wife, not on the career that I'm gonna climb that corporate ladder, not on finally getting popular and getting into the right friend group not in seeing the world and traveling and all of its sights, not even in serving other people, not even that my children being what I have always dreamed for them, not in becoming a counselor, a pastor, or a missionary. There's one hope that we're to fix with this morning. None of those hopes are necessarily bad, but they all are if they compete with the hope, with the hope, because all is going to be taken away. And you're going to lay on a deathbed unless it's a tragedy. And all will come to that place where every hope in this life will be taken away. Even the hope of your next breath will be taken. And I pray for everyone in this room that all that will be left is this one hope. This hope with finality that now when I breathe my last, I enter into the fullness of the hope that is certain because of what Jesus Christ has done. There's only one hope then that matters the one that we are to fix our minds and our hearts on with finality. This is what I'm banking everything on. This is what every other hope in my life is serving. Maybe a gut check right now is everything that you're hoping in serving this one hope. So there's nothing wrong with some hopes and things you're trying to accomplish and do, but are they all serving this one great hope? And just gut check right here. Is everything in your life identified in this one great hope? hope. The way to know if these other hopes are in the right place is when they're taken away. Is there one hope that will eclipse every other hope that I have? Nothing can diminish it. Nothing can take it away. My central and only hope that drives everything that I say and do. No matter what comes into my life, there's this one anchor. It's an anchor of my soul, this hope. I can't be blown away or tossed away from it. This is it. This is my hope. And I fixed it with finality on this one hope. And I need to get moving or we're never going to get to the communion table. The hope is on what? Look with me in verse 13. What do we fix our hope with finality upon? Well, he says, fix it completely on the grace 
to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I hope by now we know exactly what that means because we spent 12 weeks on it. This is when Jesus is, comes and the grace that now is going to be brought to you. It, it's revealed. Jesus is revealed in all of his glory. It's not eclipsed by a human frame any longer. It comes and it's just to be marveled and set on display. We'll see him. We'll be with him. We'll embrace him. We get him and it will be all of grace. Everything we've studied, it's, it's the grace of God when he appears. And what's going to be poured out on us at the revelation of Jesus Christ is him. I'm his and he is mine for all of eternity and I deserve none of it. We will worship and adore grace forever. Is that your hope? This is not a half-hearted hope. This is the preoccupation of every child of God. Let it take you away. Our hope is in God's action and that is why this is so certain. Don't miss that. The reason you can hope for Jesus Christ to come and be revealed and not shrink back is because of the grace of God. So I want you to quit fearing it, child of God. When he comes back, you're, you, you have received the grace that he has promised. You're clothed in his perfect righteousness. Your sins have been washed away. Run to this moment. Hasten it. Urge it. Don't keep shrinking back saying, oh, give me two more years to do better. That is not the gospel. This morning is this your hope. If he came back right now, I'll run to it. And my confidence is the grace of Almighty God. It is not my record sitting here this morning. It's his record. And so you will be afraid of the second coming. You'll, it, that's the worst thing you can think of this morning if you're not understanding the grace of God. And if you are, your hope has to be come right now. I'm safe. I can run to the brightest light in the world and stand in his presence blameless with great joy. Come back right now. If it's wavering or struggling, if you've got a struggling, wavering hope, I want to help you with two participles, and maybe you'll go home with a whole bunch of hope and no wavering. That's my prayer for you this morning. So second point, they're prerequisites to our preoccupation. <clears throat> the first one, Peter says, prepare your minds for action. And some of your translations say, gird your minds for action. I like that better. I don't need to sound tougher. Gird. Gird up. Gird your loins, it says. The loins of your mind, gird them up. What's gird? What does that mean? Acid reflux? No. It means to, in Ephesians, remember when we started the armor of God and he said, you know, gird up with the belt of truth. And so it meant to take these long flowing garments that everybody wore and, and to take them and lift them up and gird them into your belt so that now you are ready for action, uh, to, to go into battle, something rigorous, ready to climb or run. You've got to gird up your robe. And so take it up, tie it into your sash, uh, belt, the belt of truth. If you're a soldier, put it in there into the belt so that now you can go into battle and fight. So he comes and says, gird up your minds for action. And I got a little illustration in Exodus 12, 11. I like it. Uh, as Moses is writing, now you shall eat the Passover in this manner with your loins girded. As you eat this Passover, have your loins girded, your sandals on your feet and your staff in hand, and you shall eat in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Your deliverance is at hand. Gird up. Be ready because they're going to say, get out of here, and the whole army is going to come after you. Be ready. And so here it is. Be ready for the coming of the grace of God. Take up your loose thoughts. Gird them up. Get your mind ready for the second coming. Get your thoughts on the day that is coming. Maybe today it is coming soon. Fix your mind on that. Quit having loose thoughts all over the place. Get them on this. Don't let your thoughts get all entangled in this world. That's the world system. It wants to conform you to it. It wants all of your loose thoughts caught up in the stupid world that's going to perish. Being conformed, thinking on it, loving what it loves. Get rid of those thoughts. Gird them up. Gird up the loins of your minds. Get those thoughts disentangled and the cares and the worries of this world from your thoughts. Tie down the loose ends of your thinking. Get your mind on the truth, truth of God's word. Think God's thoughts about your life, your death, your judgment, the society, what it's peddling, what it's trying to conform you to. Think God's thoughts as aliens in this world waiting for your true home. Take up those loose thoughts. Gird them up like a sash. Stick them in your belt. 
Let your mind be preoccupied with the truth of the Scriptures and where all of Scripture is leading. The whole Bible's moving to a climax. Here it is, your blessed hope. Follow the Scriptures there in your minds. Ephesians, he calls it a belt of truth. Get in the truth about your hope. Get on a track. Uh, Make your mind running shorts. Run the race looking at the finish line where Jesus is the revelation of his grace. Did you know that the TV is not a track or a field of truth? I hate to ruin your day. TV is a bunch of lies. It's deceit. And to sit and spend all your time with that stupid thing, preaching and teaching, you know what you're doing? You're just letting every loose thought go. Every, I've never watched one show on TV that told me to gird up my mind for the second coming of Jesus Christ. When you wake up in the morning, is the first thing you run to, oh, come Lord Jesus, or do you pick up your cell phone and start looking at this world? Here's practical stuff. Those things are not going to help you gird up your thoughts. Don't let this world and all of its lies and deceits and its presentation of false hopes take over your mind. Don't let it. Gird it up. Tie in those loose thoughts. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fight. Get in this Bible. Get your mind back on what matters. I've said it before, it's not mind over matter, but having your mind on what matters. Get your mind back on what matters. You with me. Be done with fantasizing. Be done with daydreaming of all that you would do if you won the lottery or someone you want to date or, or that degree that you'll get. If, if I had a platform, I could change the world. Be done daydreaming and living in all of that stuff. They're just loose thoughts. Pin them down with finality on what you are really running after and what you are shooting for with all of this life. If I could just show you eternity for 10 seconds, you would say, how could I hope in anything here? And so just look at what's coming and fight for this. Get your minds in here. Robert Murray McShane, the great saint of the 18th century, said, try your daily occupations, your daily state of feeling, and your daily enjoyments. Try them by this test. Am I doing as I would do on the day of his coming? That's girding up your loins. That's girding up your thoughts. Uh, am I thinking, am I living and doing in such a way as if Christ returned today for his second coming? Secondly, keep sober in spirit. Second participle, how do I fix my hope? Keep sober in spirit. Why, why talk about sobriety, Peter? Why do you bring that in here? I don't even drink. What is this talking about? <laughs> it's saying, don't drink anything into the mind that numbs the mind and the heart to God's grace. Don't get your mind inebriated. Uh, getting drunk makes you see less of reality. And so you, you become more courageous and you'll say things you wouldn't normally say because you see less of reality. And so don't, don't get your minds where you're thinking earthy and getting it closed in on itself. Quit nibbling and snacking all day long at the delights and pleasures of this world. Quit spending all of your days buying the American lie, pampering your bodies and everything possible with everything that we have, giving my flesh anything and everything it wants, trying to make my stay here as comfortable as possible. I want a five-star rating. I want to have everything that this world offers. And I spend all of my days focused on how to make my time here the best. I just want comfort. I don't want to miss out on anything this world has to offer. I love Jesus, but I just want all of these other things. I won't sin with them. I just want to drink up all the blessings that God has given me. That's nonsense. My hobbies and retreats and foods and cars and houses and hot tubs, and then bathe myself in the common graces of God and thank Him as I put my head on this pillow with no hope of what is coming. My hope is just to get it right here and now And that's the opposite of this gospel. We need to repent and we need to believe the gospel and we need to set our minds, this isn't paradise. And I'm gonna deny myself, I'm gonna take up my cross and I am hoping in this day. This is where I'm running and shooting and I will come out from my culture. I will come out from all the nonsense, even in our churches. And I will will gird up my mind and I'll stay sober in spirit. It won't make me drunk with all of these things in this world or or your hope will wane and drift. And if God takes away any of your common graces, I can share this is so common, you will be undone. You'll be a cinder in the fire 
because all you want is common grace is not the special grace that's going to be revealed on the last day. That's what I want. The common graces, I won't even notice them in heaven. I just want him. What are you hoping in? What really is your hope, special grace or common grace? What is, what is it you're looking for? Could it be that all of your hopes on this earth, that you give all of your time and energies and thoughts to, will starve and weaken you greatly to your true hope that we're to fix our hearts on with finality? Robert Davis taught on fasting in Sunday school. I think that's why fasting is the forgotten means of grace. Nobody wants to deny themselves any of the pleasures of this life. I found in my own life that when my schedule is too full, even doing supposed ministry, that I get tired and I lose the sharpness of my joy and my blessed hope. When I get to doing too much, I start losing this focus and everything starts waning. And so I just can't tell you enough that we got to fight to take up our loose thoughts and stay sober in spirit and hoping for what really matters because we live in this, this suck hole, this vanity fair that is trying to get us to hope in this and we're drinking it, we're drinking the Kool-Aid. And this is a call to come out and fix your hope with finality on what really matters. The cry for moderation That's what this Greek word means, to not overcome our hopes with the common graces that are afforded to us as the children of God. So in conclusion, our salvation is so great that it should take up our minds and our hopes with it and it alone. And I want you to fight to keep your mind on what matters. One of the commentators, Robert Layton, wrote this. Those that pour themselves upon present delights They look not like strangers here and hopeful expectants of another life, which is better. If people watch and observe us, would they say, oh, they're not trying to get this life. They're waiting for a better life to come. Or would they look at us and and just say, you're no different than anybody else in this world? I was thinking about this. Would the second coming be an intrusion into your life? Would Would that be an intrusion? Fix your hope with finality. And what I want to do now is I want to go to the table and refresh our blessed hope this morning as we look at the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And I just want you to look again at how he purchased it for us. The Son of God being broken and spilled out for sinners to give us a hope that is beyond any other hope that has ever been known to man, to give us this hope of eternal life with him. And so I just pray that we will look at Jesus and our, 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 the grace of God at the cross will make us hasten the return. Because of that death, I am so safe if he comes back today. And I just, I want you to live into that freedom and not, I need 10 more years to change my life. Be, be done with that false gospel. And this morning to just look at the glories and the beauties of Christ. Well, let's pray and then we'll pass out the elements. Father, we come before you and I thank you for this blessed reminder by Peter. Lord, I thank you that Christianity does begin first and foremost in the mind. God, we are to understand truth and we're to think differently about this life. In fact, when we, when we struggle in trials, it's when we start looking at our emotions and our circumstances. And so I pray that you would revive the church of God to think, to think upon truth, the truth that you have revealed from cover to cover called the Word of God. And so, Lord, let us take our minds and gird them up with this truth, the truth that has revealed the grace of God, this truth that has your Son coming again to climax the grace of God. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to to not be inebriated in our minds with all the things of this world trying to make us love and hope this place that is dying. God, lift our hopes again to where they should be. Bring our minds and our affections again to the sweet hope of this Christ who's going to be revealed in all of his glory to be adored and worshiped forever. God, revive us again in this hope, I do pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.